convoluted. 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 Uh, complicated. We're going to do compli uh, We're going to do convolution, which in our case then in differential equations, convoluted means. Uh, or convolution means uh, we're unlaplacing the product of two functions. So we've got the product of two functions, let's say the product in Laplace world, let's say one over s squared plus one, which I know is the Laplace of sine, and capital G of s, which I guess all I know is the Laplace of little g of t. And so normally, well, not normally, but I mean, we can un-Laplace, we can take the inverse Laplace of a function plus a function. The Laplace of two functions is the sum of their transforms, or the transform of a sum is the sum of the transforms. That's one of the first rules that we proved on our chart. But we do know that the transform of two, of the product, is not just the product of the transforms. We had to do, before this, we had to do some partial fractions or break those into two pieces so it was a sum, the sum of two pieces that we would find on our chart. But convolution is going to let us um, un-Laplace or take the inverse Laplace of the product. So if I've got a function, let's say f of s, which is the product of h times g in the Laplace world, and I un-Laplace, I take the inverse Laplace of that product, it's not little h times little g, it's little h convoluted with little g. So h convoluted with g, and when I take the inverse transform of a function of s in Laplace world, I get a function of t. So this is h convoluted with g, and that's a function of t. We're defining this convolution then. It's a, I can think of it as a, a, a special form of multiply h convoluted with g is given by this definition. I integrate from 0 to t, h, the first function at t minus v, the second function at v dv. You end up integrating out the v, so you end up with then a function of t. So now let's take a look at the properties. So, so for now, let's just take it for granted that this is the definition of h convoluted with g. This is what we mean. We get it by untransforming, take the inverse transform of a product. And let's just see, let's just look at some of the properties. Now I've got h convoluted with g is equal to g convoluted with h. Um, that's how I want it to work because that's how multiplication in the real world, regular multiplication works. But how do I know that this works? Well, there's a couple of ways that we could do this. I could write out h convoluted with g and then just pop in, I know that that's equal to, or we've defined it as this integral. So I could set it in like that, then do some substitutions in the integral and switch it around to be g convoluted with h. We could do that. I'm not going to though, I'm going to prove all of these properties using the same uh, scenario. I'm going to take the transform of both sides of the thing I'm trying to prove transform it into the real world, no, transform it into the Laplace world. Once I'm in the Laplace world, convolution is just multiply in the Laplace world, and I know how multiplication works, so I can do things like, you know, if I multiply this times that, it's equal to that times this. I can switch it around in the Laplace world and then transform it back. So all four of these properties, well, no, these three properties, I'm going to prove using the same technique. So I'm only going to choose to prove one of these using that idea, and you can either prove the rest on your own. No, you should prove the rest on your own using the same technique. So, oh, well, let's take a look at this second property then. So here I've just stated that h convoluted with g is g convoluted with h. Here I've got that convolution commutes, so h, or f, a function convoluted with a sum, is equal to uh, the sum of the two products. It looks like, I guess I would say this, that convolution uh, distributes across an addition sign, which is exactly the way that you hope it should work. The last property then is, well, when I look at this, it looks like obviously this is true because I'm saying 
F convolutes with G convolutes with H is equal to the exact same thing. What I mean is that if I convolute these first two functions, I get a function. And then I convolute that with H. It's the same thing as convolute these last two functions, get a function, and then convolute it with F. So I guess we could say here that convolution has the associative property. This last one that um, f convoluted with the zero function is equal to zero, that we can just straight go into the definition. If I make the second function zero, go back up to the definition, this second function is zero, so I'm integrating zero, I get zero. The area under the zero curve is zero. So this one, this property you know, just proves itself. We haven't proven the associative, the distributive, or this um, symmetric property here. So let's think about, let's prove, let's prove one. Let's prove this middle one. All the techniques will be similar. If I want to prove this, well, in other words, I want to prove that this left side is equal to this right side. Well, I can, as long as I do the same thing to both sides of an equation, it's still an equation. So I'm going to take the Laplace of the left side, and I know that's equal to the Laplace of the right side. And we've defined then the Laplace of the left side as just being F times G plus H. Everything goes to capitals. Everything's a function of S now. So now, really, what I'm trying to prove is this. So if I can prove, if I can prove that the Laplace of the left side is equal to the Laplace of the right side, then I can just take the inverse Laplace of both of those and get the result that I'm looking for. So the Laplace of the left side equals, well, I know this is just regular multiplication, so that's just F times G plus F times H which happens to be equal to the Laplace of the right side. So now I know that the Laplace of the left side is equal to the Laplace of the right side. So I can take the inverse Laplace of both sides, and now I've proven this distributed property. The other two proofs are similar. Move everything into the Laplace world where convolution is just plain multiplication, and then use the properties that we already know, use the way we already know multiplication works. I guess now the whole thing hinges on, um, well, it hinges on, we've just sort of made up this definition. Well, no, we'll have to check this. We'll prove this at the end of, at the end of this video. But let's just try it out first. Here I've got f of s is equal to a function times a function. And if I want to take the inverse transform, this is actually where convolution is the most is the most useful for us, is taking inverse transforms. If I want to take the inverse transform of a function that I recognize is just the product of two functions, that's going to be equal to, well, okay. Getting out of the Laplace world is always the hardest. Getting in, I can use the chart. Uh, getting in, I can use the definition and just plain do that Laplace transform. Integrate from zero to infinity, e to the minus st times the thing that I'm transforming. So we can always get into the Laplace world. It's getting out where we have to massage things around with partial fractions and try and mess, uh, match the chart. This convolution idea lets us get out of the Laplace world. That's just, okay. That would be, if I unlaplace this 1 over, that's 1 over s squared plus 1. That's just sine of t. Uh, undo. If I laplace that's just sine of t, convoluted with big G on Laplace's to little g. So, now I don't know what big G is, so I don't know what little g is, but I'm outside, I'm outside of the Laplace world, I'm back in the real world. As soon as someone tells me what little g is, 
then I'll know what big G is, or vice versa. If you tell me what big G is, I can uh, figure out from the chart what little g is. And I can write this then as, I can write this as an integral. So that would be the first function evaluated at t minus v, the second function at v, and then just do this integral. Or I guess, since I know that h convoluted with g is the same thing as g convoluted with h, I could do this as, if I wanted to, I could also do this, the g at t minus v and the second function at v. These will be the same thing. Let's do an example. Now here's an example. Um, I got y prime prime plus y is equal to g of t. You could view this as a simple harmonic motion. There's no friction. Got the second. There's no friction. We got the uh, mass of one, spring constants of one, and this g of t, this forcing function, is either you can view it as an unknown forcing function. Someone's uh, shaking the spring, or you could view this as uh, someone's going to give me this g of t later. I'm building a, a general formula and then someone gives me the forcing function and I'll have my answer. But either way we could still solve it. Let's take the Laplace of let's take the Laplace of this equation. The Laplace of y prime prime would be s squared y minus s y naught minus y prime naught plus the Laplace of y equals the Laplace of little g is big G. When I collect the y's together, I get the s squared plus 1, which would be my auxiliary equation if I was doing this the eigenvalue way. So I feel good about that, is equal to, that'll be s plus 1 plus g. I got to solve for y, so y is equal to, I'm dividing out this s squared plus 1, I, I don't think I need to do partial fractions. I think what I can do here is um, just divide each divide each piece on the right hand side by the s squared plus one. And then it's already broken up. But instead of going g divided by, I'm going to go 1 over s squared so it's set up in that convolution way. So now I've got y equals, I'm going to take the inverse Laplace of both sides. Capital Y of s on Laplace is to be little y of t, that's our solution. s over s squared plus 1, that's our cos t, uh, plus here I've got my sine t plus now I could normally not do anything about this, but I'm thinking of that as sine t convoluted with g. And now <clears throat> I can write that, I can write this convolution then as, we already got that up here. I can write that convolution as an integral. Now I've got a solution to this simple harmonic uh, motion differential equation that's a nice modular solution. You pick a forcing function, I can just straight plug it in here and do that integration and it's already pre-solved. I've got my homogeneous solution and the particular solution. So this is a, a demonstrating a use for or using convolution. What about this idea here? Now, if I were to take the, I want to inverse Laplace this. Normally, if I was going to inverse Laplace this before we did, before we knew what convolution was, we break this into two pieces with partial fractions and we could just straight on Laplace that. We could straight on Laplace that, that would be like e to the minus t 
for this first piece uh, minus e to the minus 2t for the second piece. So I know that this on Laplace is to this using our regular method. But let's try out the convolution. So instead of viewing this, instead of viewing this as um, the product on the bottom, I'm going to think of this as the product of two functions. So now, when I untransform it using convolution, I'm going to get I'm going to get e to the minus the first one goes to e to the minus t, the second one goes to e to the minus two t, and I get those convoluted together. What does that mean? Well, we're going to go back up to our definition then of what convolution means. But I'm outside the Laplace world. It did its job. That would be the first function. The first function evaluated at t minus v. So I got to be careful with the brackets. At t minus v. The second function evaluated at v. And it's just a matter of do this integration. Well, it's common basis, so I'm going to add the exponents. If I add the, well, let's make this, that'll be minus t plus v when I distribute that minus, and then add another 2v, so plus v minus 2v ends up being minus v when I clean that up. Now I can do the integration. I'm doing the integration with respect to v. So with respect to v, t is a constant. And I still have to go sub in the top minus sub in the bottom. So sub in the top would be sub in t, 4v. Sub in the bottom would be sub in 0, 4v. So that equals when I sub in, when I sub in t for v, that's minus t minus t. That's going to be e to the minus 2v. When I sub in the 0, minus a minus is a plus. When I sub in the 0, I'm getting, I'm getting so I get, oh, I get the same thing as I got up here, just written in a different order. So what's the point of this example? That it looks a lot easier just to do it the old way. Mm, yes, although in the old way I went from here to here partial fractions and just like wrote it down. Um, this gets me out of the Laplace world quicker and turns it into an integral. I guess the main point is that they match, that I'm getting the same thing. It's an example of using convolution to get the inverse transform. Now, we can do examples with this, but then this whole this whole uh, section, this whole video, is hinging on this is being the definition of convolution. This whole thing is hinging on the fact that if I take the transform of H convoluted with G, that I get that I, an H convoluted, I've defined it as this weird integral, um, that if I transform H convoluted with G, I get big H times big S the product of big H and, sorry, big H and big G in the Laplace world. We have to prove that this works. And that will give us um, an understanding of why this integral is as it is. So let's take the, let's, I'm defining it like this. Let's take the transform of both sides. So if I take the transform, if I take the transform of H convoluted with G, we're saying that's supposed to be H times G. Well, let's take the transform of 
let's take the transform of this weird integral and show that that's what we get. Well, if I'm taking the transform of an integral, that's why I've got this definition up here. I know what the trans I know what the transform of any function is. It's just integrate from zero to infinity e to the minus st times whatever you're transforming. So this would be the transform of h convoluted with g. And I've got a double integral. Now those of you that have had multivariable calculus know that and that's where double integrals usually show up. It's always tested or one of the, one of the things we always do with a double integral is switch the order of integration. So this is integrating first dv and then dt. They'll ask me to integrate this, solve this with uh, dt first and then dv. And I can't just switch to dt and dv unless it's a rectangle because this is a v equals zero and v equals t and the t goes from zero to infinity. So what I have to do then is write this as I guess I need to draw this. I need to draw the shape. V starts at zero and goes to T. T goes from zero to infinity. I need to draw this region over which I'm doing this integral. One thing to note though is this inner integral is with respect to V. And there's no V in that E to the minus ST. So it's totally okay to just bring it inside. Now it even looks more like a double integral. Let's draw this shape then, where v goes from 0 to t, and t goes from 0 to infinity. So, I want to switch the order of integration. So I want to think of this integral then, this double integral, as over a region. I'm integrating over an area, this function over an area in the uh, TV plane. So here we've drawn it then. So I'm integrating well, what area is it? Let's take a look here. V. V goes from V goes from zero to T. So here's V. V goes from zero to T. Zero to T. Zero to T. And then T goes from zero to infinity. So, I'm doing this region right here, all the way to infinity. Let's go, let's go, let's go. All right. So, I want to switch them then. I want to do it over an area. I want to do t first. Well, if I'm doing t first, t goes from, okay, these endpoints we got to switch. t goes from where? t starts at, t's going T's going, let's switch the color. T's going this way. T's starting on the line and going this way. Starting on the line in this shape and going this way. Starting on the line and going this way. So it's starting on T equals V and going to infinity. So T is starting on the line, T equals V, and going to infinity in this shape. And then V goes from 0 to infinity. The end, the end, uh, the last endpoints are all on a on a double integral like that. It's always number to a number. So now we've set this up, we switched it from dv dt to t dv. And this almost looks like, okay, first I'm integrating with respect to t. So this has no t's on it, so it can go outside the t integral, just like I brought this one inside. This almost looks like going from v to infinity almost looks like a Laplace transform if I could do a substitution. So I'm going to do a substitution. I'm going to let... Um, I'm going to let u equal to t minus v. 
if I let u equal to t minus v, when u is equal, so when this will become h of u then, du equals dt, so I could do a uh, swap out with that. Straight substitution, have to differentiate my substitution. So then this will end up being h of u dv uh, dt is equal to du when t is equal to v u is equal to zero so I just did a plain substitution and what else we're integrating with respect oh wait I, got, I can't leave it these t's anymore so that means that t is equal to uh, u plus v And when I put in t equals to u plus v, let's clean this up a little bit here. That's going to be s minus s u times e to the, so I'm distributing, I'm splitting that piece up basically. And that'll be e to the minus s times v. And this s times v can come to the outside because there's no u's in it. So now this is my first integration, my inner integration. But notice, if I were to do this, that's the definition of, I can replace this whole integration by, that's just the transform of h. So this whole thing just becomes h of s by definition. And there's no more v's in it. It's a constant. So I can just bring that to the outside. Now, oh wait, what's the leftover? What's this leftover piece? That's just the, by definition, the Laplace transform of G. So the whole thing equals H of S times G of S. So when I take the transform of this definition, I get H times G. So in other words, if I define, if I use this integral to define the convolution, when I take the transform of H convoluted with G, I do get h of s convoluted with g of s. This weird integral then, this integral, this convoluted integral works for unlaplacing. If I unlaplace this, I'll get this as defined by this integral. Done. Would, would I have to repeat this integral? Uh, no, but I remember when I learned differential equations um, as a student way back in um, the early 80s, uh, they, the early, yeah, where, where Microsoft Paint was a, a popular program, almost. They'd almost been invented. Uh, anyway, I wasn't shown this, that my instructor, my teacher, my professor just threw down this definition and said, this is what convolution means, and we never actually proved it, so I had to take them on faith. It's always nicer to see the proof.